Great. Okay. Should we start? Yep. Yes. So, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to present my paper on care identity or policy. What do voters care about most? Now, this is, of course, part of my PhD research. Um, my dissertation is titled An MP Who Looks Like Me. And it's about how does sharing the same religion, migration, background, and gender influence voting in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, now, one of the most unique parts of my research is that I study minoritized voters. Now, what I mean by minoritized voters is that these are people who society considers to be a minority. Um, now, not everyone that society considers to be a minority is a minority, and not everyone who is a minority uh, society considers to be one. Um, for instance, not all people with a migration background are actually considered to have a migration background or to be minoritized, like me. Um, and on the other side, besides uh, people who are minoritized, you also have majoritized voters, and this is an even less common phrase, but that's actually the opposite of this, uh, those in society who society considers to be part of the majority. So anyway, um, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, um, and I'm going to kind of explain my theoretical framework, framework and which concepts I work with the most and uh, what my expectations are. Um, so my research is basically about representation. Um, now, Pitskin in 1967 already uh, defined these four dimensions, dimensions of representation, formalistic representation, descriptive representation, which I uh, um, just uh, uh, call identity here, substantive representation, which I would consider to be policy, and symbolic representation is what you feel represented. Now, this study that I'm presenting here is mostly about symbolic representation. And to use the terminology of Pitkin, I'm basically asking, do voters feel more symbolically represented by descriptive rep or substantive representation? Um, now, a very uh, logical social uh, or uh, theoretical framework that I use is social identity theory. They consider uh, social identity, identity to be uh, a relation between groups. Um, and basically, what is most the most cited part of social identity theory is that generally people strive for in-group favoritism, so they prefer their in-group. Super basic. What most people don't know that much is that in social identity theory, they also write a whole lot uh, in the original text about social status. And what I consider to be, or what they consider to be, social status is that the outcome of an intergroup comparison, and there's a hierarchy in this, of course. Um, and they say that social status also really kind of influences uh, in-group favoritism, and this influence is not a one-way street. So high-status groups are most likely to favor the in-group, whereas low-status groups, especially those with high permeability, will disidentify people who have the option to uh, identify with something else and might prefer the high-status groups more. And low-status group with low permeability will will be more likely to use social creativity to elevate the status of their in-group and thus be able to prefer their in-group more. So it isn't as simple as this whole concept of in-group favoritism actually makes it look like. Now, one of my favorite presentations in the Hot Politics Lab uh, was by Ashley Jardina. Um, she presented her book, White Identity Politics. And what I really liked about this book is that she really questions whether whose identity is it about when we talk about identity politics. Now, most people, when they talk about identity politics, are talking about minoritized identities. But uh, what she says is that too much of it is focused. It's also, again, very one-sided. Uh, too much of, it is, of uh, identity politics, politics is focused on minoritized identities, um, and there's too little fo focus on majoritized identities. Um, and what she also says is white people have the luxury uh, of not thinking about their racial group. Um, now, so this kind of shows both, both sides, right? So um, on the one hand, you have <laughs> uh, people say, well, there's in-group favoritism. On the other hand is people saying, well, that mostly uh, applies to high status groups. They will be more likely to prefer their in-group, but there's also a situation where low status groups will also prefer their in-group. So what should I ever pre-register? <laughs> anyway, so um, to kind of figure out what which direction to think in, um, I did what I recommend a lot of beginning PhD students to do, if it's possible, I ran a meta-analysis. 
So this meta-analysis, um, I um, uh, got brought together all the studies from 2012 to 2022 with shared identification. So where, uh, and these are all uh, conjoint experiments where I know the um, racial background of the uh, voter, but also of the politician. And I saw, I, I tried to check whether, you know, whether it really matters that they share the same identity. And this is for race and ethnicity. Um, so this is an N of 52,000. It has, and it has very significant effects. What you see here is all the way in the bottom, that there's a 7.9 percentage point X size. So it's pretty sizable for experimental research. Now this also, um, I also ran this for majoritized voters or um, where we don't know exactly the background of the, of the voter general population. This has an end of more than 200,000, 250,000, and the overall effect size is not significant. It's a tiny, tiny positive effect size. So it seems like, you know, there's really this um, uh, in-group favoritism that mostly applies to racial and ethnic minorities, minoritized people. Anyway, so I also published a paper on this uh, with this meta-analysis where you can find all the replication materials. Um, so, but there are also a couple of different caveats to this meta-analysis. Uh, the shared identification data, none of it uh, is from Europe. Um, there hasn't ever been a study in which they look at shared identification um, in an experimental way between voters and politicians uh, in Europe. And none of them include religious congruence either. So, yeah, so it's none of them are in Europe, but they are kind of all over the world. Um, but to be honest, to be completely honest, almost all of the studies are from the US. <laughs> not, not surprising. So what about Europe? Europe could be totally different in this respect. Um, so with my research that I'm doing, I'm filling multiple research gaps. Um, I'm studying uh, French, German, and Dutch uh, voters. I'm looking at minoritized voters. Uh, I'm including policy positions in my uh, um, experimental profiles, um, and I'm also including uh, politician religion. So anyway, so I pre-registered uh, a bunch of hypotheses at OSF, um, and I want to thank Heisinger a lot for helping me with that and also inspiring me to do so. Um, and what I pre-registered, basically, these are the uh, hypotheses that um, uh, these minoritized groups will prefer politicians who look like them. Uh, and also women, um, also minoritized, also prefer female politicians. But what I also pre-registered, and this is kind of uh, um, uh, contrary to this, is that still, despite this, respondents prefer politicians with similar policy positions to politicians with similar descriptive characteristics. So I also pre-registered that, you know, policy trumps all of this uh, Trump's identity. Um, so my experimental attributes consisted of gender, migration background, and religion. Uh, so as I said, I, I um, gathered data in uh, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. So I also chose migration backgrounds that are most common in those countries. Um, in each experimental profile of politicians for these uh, conjoint experiments, I also included a policy physician, now, these are eight policy positions that I included. Uh, I, I randomized whether they were for or against this, poli uh, this policy position. Uh, and I kind of tried to pick policy positions kind of generally that made sense in all countries and that are all around the, uh, um, uh, uh, anyway, the voting field. So it's about taxing the rich, supporting the unemployed, combating climate change, raising fuel prices, immigrants are an asset, Islam should be restricted. Uh, gender pay gap or same-sex adoption. So anyway, I, um, I ran into a whole lot of methodological challenges as well, um, because the most important part of this research is about getting those minoritized voters in, uh, but that's really difficult to sample. I mean, if you sample the general population, uh, there's not enough religious and ethnic diversity to have enough statistical significance or uh, power, um, and there's also not a sampling frame in Europe. The uh, GDPR, the private reg regulations, don't allow uh, saving information on race, race ethnicity, or religion. Um, so that makes it really difficult to sample this. So what I did, the solution to this was that I, uh, I worked with the panel of Comptar Public in all these countries. Um, they have a really close to random selection panel, randomly selected panel. 
Um, on all these panelists, I ran a mini survey in which I asked the migration background of the uh, respondents. Uh, and then the people with a migration background that I was interested in, I redirected them to the full survey. Those who did not have a migration background, I redirected, redirected a smaller group to the full survey. So that let, gave me the following sample sizes. Uh, in the end, I have mostly people without a migration background, but I oversampled people with these migration backgrounds that I'm most interested in as well, you know, in order to make all these between group comparisons. So these uh, respondents, I gave them, um, uh, I gave them, the, I showed them these profiles, um, and I asked them a couple of questions about these politicians. I showed them two after each other. Um, here, here's an example. And after that, I asked them, which of these two politicians are you most likely to vote for? Um, and I repeated this a couple of times. Um, so, to the results, I mean, what are we going to find? Um, do minoritized voters prefer their in-group? Do majoritized voters prefer their in-group? Or do voters prefer sharing the same policy position the most? I mean, what's going to happen? This was as much as a surprise. This was, this was a surprise for me as well. Anyway, so just gonna, I'm just going to kind of run through this data. Uh, does it matter whether a citizen and politician share the same gender? Now, as you can see here, it, you know, not much is happening, so it doesn't really matter. Um, another question, does it matter that they share the same migration background? Again, yes, same, again, slightly more, but nothing significant. It's all really close to 50%, so nothing's really happening. Sharing the same religion really does show an effect. See, so you see sharing the same religion, um, people prefer them significantly more than people who don't share the same religion. But then when you look at policy position, you see it's a much bigger effect. So people care, this is good news for democracy, I'd say, people care the most about um, sharing the same policy position. But what's interesting, and here I, I put them all, put them all together, so you can compare them, but this comparison is really too, really too simplistic, right? Because Sharing the same policy position doesn't mean that you're both in favor or both against. But most importantly, sharing the same religion doesn't mean that these are non-religious uh, voters judging non-religious voters or Muslims judging Muslims. So this is really, really way too simplistic. So I'm going to look at it in uh, a more nuanced way. So I combine policy or religion uh, in my analysis. Um, and I look at when choosing between sharing the same policy and uh, and religion, what do voters choose? So here I have a subsample. So these are only the Muslim voters uh, in my sample. And you can really see that um, the first three lines that you see, you see that they, they share the same policy position. And there's actually no difference between whether a Muslim voter prefers a Muslim politician. It's slightly more, but it's not a significant difference. Or whether a non-religious politician prefers, uh, sorry, or whether a Muslim citizen prefers a non-religious politician. Yeah, it's slightly less, but there's no significant difference. But then whether they have a different policy position, the last three lines, you see there's a really big difference. Uh, so this shows that for Muslim voters, it really doesn't matter whether they're Muslim or non-religious, policy position matters the most. Now this is different for non-religious citizens. You can really see the difference. So here, Muslim citizens and non-religious citizens, and you see that the effect sizes are more kind of spread out. Again, it's really the biggest difference between whether you do or do not share the same policy positions, but within that, there's a bias in favor of, uh, amongst non-religious citizens, there's a bias in favor of non-religious politicians, or would you call it a bias against Muslim politicians? Uh, you see that Christian politicians really play a, a, a yeah, intermediary role. Um, here I have them all together, together with what Christian, Christian citizens do. Um, and you really see that these, yeah, they just, the effect sizes become a little bit more spread out. Um, anyway, so what does this mean and what, how does this bring us back to the theory that I started off with? So if you, in the words of the concept of representation by Pitkin, I'd say substantive representation matters the most to voters, far. But it again, indeed, as they say in social identity theory, in-group favoritism seems to be a one-way street. Um, and it seems that identity politics, as in you know, voting for someone who looks like you, is practiced most by majoritized non-religious voters. Um, but of course, 
There's, I can also criticize this in many different ways. Um, there's always questions to be asked about the sampling. Um, I had a yeah, slightly more highly educated sample, uh, but the policy positions also, I mean, these are eight policy positions all across the voting field, but there are so many other policy positions that might be more salient. Um, also, a criticism is I made Muslims very visible in my, uh, uh, and in real life, I mean, very often politicians with the background in a Muslim country aren't as open about whether they're not Muslim or not, and I also said they practice uh, uh, Islam. So that's, yeah, that really makes it very visible, whereas in real life that might not be the case. Um, on the other hand, another uh, caveat is that these are the conjoint experiments and it only measures the first impression, whereas in real life, I mean, you go through these whole campaigns and um, uh, all kinds of stuff happens and you get hate campaigns, you get reactions to that, you get, you know, all kinds of stuff happening. And this is really the, the, the split second uh, reaction. Um, and another criticism that you could have is what about heuristics? So maybe non-religious voters are really discriminating against Muslims um, or are they reading policy into identity? Is it that the policy that they expect uh, from a Muslim politician is policy that they, they don't like and it's not really has anything to do with whether they're Muslim or not? Now, I also published a paper on this um, and it really seems like, yes, there's a lot of stereotyping going on. Although, um, yeah, there's also some evidence for projection taking place. Um, and yeah, I wanted to open the floor and ask if there are any questions or any clarifications. And I'm really curious to hear what you think. Thank you very much. So that was a very quick course on how to present your entire dissertation in 20 minutes <laughs> and run through 50 slides, I think. Yeah, something like that, yeah. 47. <laughs> so that's almost a uh, politics life record. There's one proud person who is on top of Iman mentioned. Uh, <laughs> questions for some. Come on, this is not the first year bachelor of course. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, um, it's 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 really interesting. So also the the, the fascinating the two graphs you show and how they're more spread out. But I was wondering to what extent are, uh, do you think or do you know that the effects are conditional on context? So I could imagine that the extent to which an issue is salient, for instance, plays a role. If we uh, take a hypothetical example of an election where political discontent plays an important role, a divide between the rural and uh, urban areas plays an important role, I could imagine that people are more likely to vote for a politician who is just like us, right? Uh, people from the countryside, for instance. Um, but that, that is that that such uh, uh, a motivation to vote for someone who looks like me in terms of class, for instance, that that plays a more important role if if if, if the issues are salient that that are related to that. So, to what extent do you think, or do you know that in your case also issues might have influenced? relationship between yeah yeah definitely um i'm really happy you asked this because um i also looked at because i also had all these policy positions so these eight different policy positions and i of course also looked at um how it's you know how people evaluate muslims or non-religious politicians are all over the place um, um uh, with a specific policy position and whether it matters you know whether they're in favor or against um, and not very surprisingly, I found that gender equality is a really, really uh, big driver for evaluations of Muslim politicians. Um, and I was thinking of writing a, another paper about that because it was just such an uh, interesting result and I didn't pre-register it at all. I tried to fit it into this paper at a certain point, but then it started getting too full. But what I found is that when non-religious politicians see a Muslim politician who, uh, sorry, when non-religious non voters see a Muslim politician who is in favor of gender equality, they actually um, are equally likely to vote for them as for non-religious politicians. So that's good news, I guess we could say. But if a Muslim politician is against gender equality, then that uh, non-religious voter is uh, significantly more likely to, uh, less likely to vote for them, um, even less likely than if it was a non-religious politician with the exact same policy position. In other words, you can make up for being Muslim 
uh, as a politician by being in favor of gender equality, but you're punished for it much more if you're a Muslim uh, than if you're non-religious. So that's that's a way in which uh, there's a really interesting uh, yeah, interaction with specific policy positions. And I see that a little bit generally as well. I saw it most clearly with, gen with um, gender equality, but I see it across the board that you know, if you're uh, against something, and, uh, against a policy position and a, and a voter is in favor of that, Muslims get punished for that a little bit more. Uh, but I didn't see it as clearly with, uh, as with uh, uh, gender equality. Other questions? Okay. I have a small clarification question. But, uh, oh yeah, great presentations on it. Thank you. We like to look for rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Science stuff. Really, really well. I mean, that's right. Okay, so <laughs> my uh, clarification question you mentioned in the end, like, oh, one of the caveats here, of course, is it, I made like being Muslim like very visible in the research. Did you do the same thing with the uh, with Christians? Yeah, okay. yeah, equally visible. I mean, it was uh, practices Christianity. Yeah. And, uh, and for non religious politicians, they said, does not practice any religion. That's the literal way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that was my thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it is equally visible. So, yeah. but I think it's it's more common in Germany and France that a politician says that they're, they practice Christianity than that uh, a politician says, I practice Islam. So um, there's a lot of cases. There are some, you know, openly Muslim politicians, of course, in Parliament, in the Netherlands as well. Uh, but a lot of politicians with a uh, migration background in a Muslim majority country will kind of dance around the topic a little bit because they know what kind of the backlash they can get. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then, do you have some sort of data of where the people exactly in these countries are from? Because then, with Christianity, for example, it would be super interesting to see whether there's a, a difference from the like, countryside to cities for example mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah I, I can look at that yeah i should i would just i could just imagine that i don't know i think of, i mean i only know germany very well but there the christianity is much more prevalent in the south uh, obviously in bavaria and very irrelevant in the north yeah and then also pretty irrelevant in big cities usually yeah. but yeah 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 because i looked at whether the voter is christian themselves mm -hmm. or identified as christian um, that's because that's how I asked the question. But it would be interesting to see whether, uh, yeah, countryside or not. Because I have I have all that data. Uh, whether that matters, it would, yeah, irrespective of whether the respondent is Christian themselves. Yeah, so we're interesting. I didn't look at that. There's a question online from uh, Rebecca Kisberg, the postdoc in our group. Um, Really interesting, uh, in your results, you framed it as same different gender does not really impact voting, but religion does. However, people might find gender, however, <laughs> people might find gender, I think there's a, a mistake here, uh, might find gender less central to their identity compared to religion. So I'm wondering if you included a measure of the importance of the identity of yourself. Uh, yeah, I, um, not in this paper, but I also look at uh, the extent to which you identify as Muslim. Um, I want to write a different paper of that, but about that. Uh, and for these experiments, um, I don't find any effect of that. So I don't find any evidence, um, despite there being quite a bit of literature, but I find no evidence of um, Muslims who identify strongly as being Muslim or who think it's a very important part of their life and their social their social life is the way that I ask questions. I use an ethnocentrism scale and apply that to both uh, minoritized ethnicities and religion um, and, uh, and majoritized as well. Um, and I don't find any evidence that people, uh, for instance, with migration background in Turkey who identify as Turkish and identify strongly as Turkish, that they are more likely to vote for uh, a Turkish politician. I also don't find this for Muslims. Um, I, um, so Muslims who identify more strongly as Muslim don't tend to vote, uh, at least in this experiment, tend to vote for uh, Muslim politicians anymore. I didn't ask this for, for gender. I do have a sexism scale and there's all kinds of stuff going on there as well. <laughs> Not getting started. Uh, but anyway, but what I find is most interesting, and this is something that I also want to write another paper about, is that I also ask 
<laughs> about to what extent do you identify as French, German, or, or Dutch? Um, and the more you identify as French, German, or Dutch, you, you'll, you're guessing where I'm heading, uh, the more likely you are to favor a French, German, or Dutch uh, politician as well. So I don't find I'm supposed to. Yeah, as a uh, yeah, as opposed as opposed to a politician with a migration background. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So um so that yes. you as a French citizen are more in favor of a German politician. Yeah, 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 yeah not in any country, yeah, yeah. Okay. Except the country. Okay. Um so yeah, so I do find that that's and that kind of is in line with what I'm concluding here. Uh majoritized identity matters more. Yes. So do you find any interesting differences between countries? Yeah, I was hoping someone would ask that. Um, I actually have like uh, uh, an appendix to my <laughs> uh, and long story short, I don't. Oh. Um, yeah, so that's why that's which is good because uh, before I started this project, I was really I got a lot of uh, well criticism, uh, critical questions, good questions about you know what is this the Netherlands, Germany, and France? Is this most similar system design or is this most different system design? Tell me. And I was struggling with this so much because you could argue, you could argue for both. Anyway, I gathered the data and you know it really looks very similar. So this is this, these are the patterns in the three countries that you see right here. Um, and it's it's really simple, uh, uh, similar, um, and that's makes it okay to, I think, uh, to stack the data. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. It's just, uh, super cool. I just was wondering, you have this representation frame. Um, but you could have a different frame as well, which is a sort of against the group theory of voting. It yeah. seems to me like a bigger prize for the kinds of debates that are. So you think the Asian and Bartels group, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that this is like a vindication of a rational choice type theory, per se, but, but I'm thinking uh, it's interesting. There is a, an oddity that you know, some of the same people who defend the group theory of voting also find that the policy, the substantive representation is also not there at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you'd have a problem to explain why that is the case. They have a new story to tell the group theory. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, but then you know, you'd have to compare the distance of this order that in this environment about, uh, you know, replication of the, so that, you know, the famous, you know, testing theories paper, et cetera, and this kind of, you have to explain how that divergence goes with this, I and mean, it could be that it's a story about well, this works for first impressions and not actual voting behavior. So there's complications there, but I'm thinking that there's a bigger prize there, at least yeah. gesturing towards. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. this is definitely experimental evidence. So indeed, first impression evidence against this group theory of voting. Um, but I also have another paper in my dissertation that it where I mean yeah yeah so where and this is a paper that I also presented at, at challenges and it's a paper about Dank where I do find identity effects that there is you know the more you identify as Muslim the more likely you are to vote for Dank but there's something and the design there that's about actual voting that's about actual voting propensity to vote so that's really measuring really something something different so that's not the first impression um, it's also not whether you do or do not vote for Dank but the likelihood of voting for Dank. Um, and there, I, I do find slightly, yeah, slightly different effects. Also, this is evidence. Guys, we need to yeah. wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could go on. We we'll we'll talk more over drinks. <laughs> Thanks, Lord Sana. Yes.